Hello and welcome to Clappercast. I'm your host as always, Carson Tamar, and this week, to continue our Summer of Blockbuster series, I am joined by Hilary White and Mr. Editor-in-Chief Jack Luke Sharp to review James Cameron's Titanic. Of course, one of the biggest films of all time, a truly classic love story following the relationship of two passengers on board the tragic voyage of the RMS Titanic. This is a massive feature that has many ups and many downs, and today we're here to discuss its legacy, we're here to debate its quality, we're going to deep dive a bit into our views on James Cameron, debate him as a director, debate the path of his career, and ultimately come to a conclusion on why Titanic has become one of the highest grossing films of all time. If you're a fan of this film, or you hate this film, if you're one of those haters out there, I see you. This is going to be a very, very fun conversation for both sides, and I hope everyone enjoys. So let's get to our review and our breakdown of Titanic. Okay, everybody, so before we get into our review of Titanic and discussing it, let's get to the story of Titanic, quickly breaking down the situation, because out of every film I think we've talked about, maybe with the exception of Jaws, this is the one that everyone was prepared to be a box office disaster. This was like out of nowhere that this became a success. Um, It ballooned into being the most expensive film of all time. They originally wanted it to come out during the summer, got pushed to December due to production. They wanted a big L.A. premiere. James Cameron said, no, I'm not doing an L.A. premiere. We're going to uh, debut it in Tokyo. The reactions were mixed. It was going to be basically the thought process from Titanic being released was not, is this going to be a success? It was going to be how many millions is this going to lose um, the production companies behind it? And then all of a sudden it released on December 19th, 1997 to wide acclaim. Everyone loved this film and it blew up. Um, setting box office records. It was the most successful Christmas Day box office of all time at the time. Um, it absolutely did numbers on a global perspective. It was one of the first films to ever really touch India and do really good marketing in India, actually, um, which everyone says is because it's Bollywood elements. I don't quite know if I see the Bollywood elements personally. Maybe we can get into that later. Um, but even to the point where this is a three and a half, basically, hour film, they would ha- program this at midnight because you couldn't run over you couldn't run four screenings during the day because of its length you had to run three so they would program it at midnight and it would be sold out until 3 30 a.m a crazy reaction whether it's because the romance whether it's because leo for whatever reason titanic blew up and we've talked about very successful films on the series so far but when you look at the current box office with all the re-releases this is a new level of success grossing a total right now of 2.264 billion dollars on a 200 million dollar budget Right now, it is number four on the box office of all time. Um, I think the last one we talked about was the biggest, and that was in like the 70s. This is like, we've talked about successful films. This is one of the biggest films of all time, truly, to this day. It was unmatched at the number one position for over a decade until a film we'll talk about later on this series. (laughs) Um, A big debut, a big film, Cameron's success. Was it good? Uh, Hillary, I would love as you're the guest today to start out with your history with Titanic and maybe getting into some of your overall thoughts on the film, um, and then we'll go deeper with the episode. Uh, Yes, um, I ended up seeing this film for kind of a strange reason. I think you set up things very well. Um, I wasn't prepared for what this film actually was or what the craze about around it was all about. Um, We had like this little mini unit in sixth grade about the Titanic. And I found the tragedy very fascinating as far as like what happened to the people on there, how, you know, everything went wrong. And it was just like this horrible mistake that had happened out in the middle of the ocean. So I went to the film thinking it was just going to be about the Titanic. And I was incredibly naive. I, I wasn't prepared for the love story or anything like that. And, um, I have to say, like the craze around this movie, I don't, I don't know. Actually, we've established our ages. Like you guys were probably really, really young. Like, how old were you guys when this film came out? A year old. You were a year I, old, and how I old was were not? You? I was not in existence. Okay, yeah, I was, I was prepared for that. I was going to say, like, were you guys alive when this came out? I cannot, <laughs> like, what Carson said is true. I cannot describe people lost their minds when this film came out and um to date myself um i just turned 40 like uh several months ago 
and I was 13 when this came out. I was so clueless. Like I could not describe what happened. I was in middle school. P- I, yeah, I can't emphasize enough. Like girls in particular, like lost their fucking minds. I, you just had to mention the movie and people would start screaming and crying. I mean, it was insane anyway. Um, so there was a lot of hype around it. I saw it several times and I kind of went in a lot to see the film kind of like, uh, to make fun of it. Um, because, uh, I was kind of an outcast in that way, but, um, I ended up seeing it, I think four times cause the film ran in theaters for a year, maybe even longer, which seems totally crazy now because things kind of, you know, yeah. go so quickly and then end up on streaming. This film was so successful. I think it ran for over a year. Um, and, uh, I, I had kind of a weird relationship with it, um, that came across in the review I put up in Letterboxd last night upon rewatching it. Um, I get really twitchy and nervous and can't really pay attention. And I don't know, maybe it's just because it's connected to a time in my life that was, you know, painful, you know, because it's just like you're in middle school, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but I can't completely, um, I can't completely explain it. So, uh, the, the film is, I'd say it's both good and it's bad in some ways. Um, and it will get more into that as we go along. So those are my opening thoughts. I don't want to ramble for too long. That's for sure. I love having this perspective of someone who saw it in theaters. We should have had Jakob on the Jaws episode so he could say what it was like going to see it as a teenager. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Jack, what is your history with the film? (laughs) That's cruel. Um, that's the chair, by the way, that's not me. Um, I have like a love hate relationship, very much like what Hillary said, but my hate for this comes into a question that you're going to ask a little bit later. So I'm going to start with the positives here. Um, I agree with Hillary. I can't understand or quite <laughs> analyze why this is as big as it was. I mean, I was a year old when this came out, so I found this on video. And I, I remember having um, very conscious memories of watching this a lot on video and, and watching Rome and Juliet for some reason. I would just found that there were, there were two. Uh, types of like films within like we had like a small video collection here like the, and the Terminator and Commando and, and the Matrix and uh, Star Wars Indiana Jones I remember just rinsing those videos and just because they were so different to watch of everything else I'd seen before um, watching this again I, I do I do quite enjoy the experience but it's one that feels really interesting to talk about more on a on a on a level of filmmaking quality because it very much is a simplistic little venture. There's the, it, it, it's very much James Cameron into a T where there isn't much narrative going on. It's quite linear, quite structured. There's not much there that we can have a real discussion about because it's it's very much playing into casual convention. But from what you said, Carson, about your opening about this was was alleged to to bomb. I can't help but think that this has been purposely built to scientifically go against it. Because I was writing in my notes earlier about how. This is built it, it, as it, everybody knows how this film is going to end, one way or another. Like you know, it's notoriety precedes it in it that it sinks. So what he has to he has to predispose that with making a narrative that's engaging and immersive. So we ultimately forget the tragedy that's yet to come, and then when it hits, it doubles down because we all we all know it's going to happen. But it happening if it's happening anywhere, um, it destabilizes the viewer, and. I think the only way he could do that was make it into a romance because you can't do an action film. I think like what Hillary said when, when you were younger about thinking what could it be not knowing it was a romance. I think it, looking back now, you do think it's the it's like a, um, a Roland Emmerich type of or a Titanic where we're going to watch the film sink. But it really isn't about that. It really is. But it, put, it puts the, the romance plot really high in the sky. Um, I'm not really into those type of features, but it does... It is carried by the weight of its of its of its characters and it, and its ultimate by its performances. But I, I enjoyed it. But I do I do look at this now with a, a level of animosity of what it caused, not only within the social su- structure of, of cinema, but also what it did to James Cameron, which we'll touch on a bit later. But this is probably my first film for um, for probably Leonardo DiCaprio. I think Romeo and Juliet is probably a year before, and that's ninety six is ninety seven. But I wasn't really conscious of that. And I think it's my first look at Kate Winslet as well. Um, I know she's British, but I don't remember seeing anything before this. And I'll be honest, I don't remember seeing anything after this for a while until The Reader, which is like a 10-year gap. Um, so it was an interesting film to get into. 
I'm very I'm very fascinated to talk about the production of this as well because from my they could only afford to to, to render one side of the Titanic because <laughs> it was such a, 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 a huge scale of ILM. Um, so it's just literally uh, uh, the, the image is reversed on when it's going a different direction. So it's just interesting to talk about, but I'm, I'm very much to, to hear what you both got to say further on. But for me, it, 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 I have a lot of animosity towards it for what it caused. But watching it in the open matte version that we we saw it in, this film looks beautiful as well. And I do feel that it's very much an egotistical vanity project from its opening 25 minutes about going down to the depths to actually see this beast. I think that's I think that's such a wonderful, um, unprecedented and genuinely um, profound moment. We start this film actually seeing the wreck, and then we see it in its maiden voyage um, in, through through the means of CGI. Like we ultimately build it back up to watch on screen to watch its. There's something really poignant and profound about it that always gets to me, but it was really fun to watch again. So I'll lead it over to you, Gasson. I feel like this is one of the films, I feel like I watched it when I was younger, specifically because I remember the VHS, the novelty of it being such a long film that it was split between two VHSs and a pack. But I don't yeah. like actually have any memories watching it. I just have the memory of having the VHS, but I'm sure I watched it at some point. Um, I watched it, like, really sat down and watched it for the first time last year during the re-release in theaters. And I will say, I think I'm the most positive probably on this one. Um, I really love Titanic. I think this is such a cute romance. Um, interesting, some filmmaking choices, some just generalized choices. Um, definitely, there's a lot to get into. Um, but as someone who hadn't really seen it, I will say, like, this is one that I think, especially on the big screen, and granted, a lot of films started this length and this size, you kind of need to watch it on the big screen, I feel. But um, I think it holds up remarkably well. So I don't have a long history with Titanic, as with all the films we're talking about really on this series. Um, but it's one that I have a, a brief but undeniably positive relationship with. I've also always been kind of fascinated by the Titanic. Um, I remember going to like the exhibit, and that was really cool. Um, my mom's side of the family immigrated on the same boat that saved the people from the Titanic that's at the end of this wow. film um, to America. So I got a connection to the Titanic. Like, wow. I've always been really fascinated by the Titanic, so maybe I'm also just a a little bit more engaged with like the film than some, but I really enjoy Titanic, I guess, getting it out of the way. <laughs> um, but I would love to hear um, maybe some of the negatives. Let's maybe let's start with some of the negatives that you guys see, and then we'll work our way towards the positives. We'll start at the bottom of the ocean and work our way up to the beautiful sky, um, the altered new sky for the version. That's correct because heaven forbid the film has the wrong stars in the sky. Oh. <laughs> Oh boy. Um, I don't mind. Start. I don't. I don't know. I don't. I, I don't want to get into the, the question just yet. Why I actually like detest this in some ways, but I'll talk about um, about the, the the negatives first. So I think it does. It does falter ultimately from its box office stardom in the fact that you have two very naive, up and coming actors and actress with Kate and DiCaprio. I know you can say DiCaprio has been to certain highlights, but this is all. This is mass amounts of stardom because I think he refused to. Uh, he refused to. Um, uh, test for this as well, and and I think someone was like, "It's James Cameron. It's going to be quite big. You need to test." And and, and through that ego, which I don't think he's done him uh, much disservice in his life, but it's interesting that they get two quite green up and coming um, performers, and I think that showcases on screen really, really well. I find them really affectionate. I find them really bubbly. I I love the green um naivety they've got which is just means that like they're so naive to a point where they're just they're, they're loving life they don't really understand the the, the 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 repercussions of it and i think with the immigrant tale i think it, it helps really well what the film does falter is i just don't think it's got a strong enough um villain because the tragedy in itself is always going to be a third party to this but ultimately to to, to render this narrative of the romance you need an antagonist and I think Billy Zane is someone who I think has always had very interesting screen presence. And I think you could probably say he's got a bit of charisma. I think like the Phantom is, def is definitely a prime example. And his cameo in Zoolander, uh, I think he'd probably be <laughs> struck to find something else. But no, no, no disservice to him. I just think that the film struggles with that human character because the, the occasion itself is so humongous and so devastating. And it somewhat dwarfs that, which I think probably works in the benefit of the film in that human life like this uh, uh, is quite trivial to the to the 
to the death toll that, that, that of, of an ignorance of what people did on that boat and and that the actual devastation in itself. I think you can probably make an argument for that. But for me, when I look at it, I think David Warner there as well. Or is, um, it's just. I don't. I just find it like very difficult to watch, and every time he's on screen, I'm like, I, he's playing a pompous arsehole, and he plays it really well. But I, I just find that character one to be quite trivial. But I'll say this: he, he's one of those performances in here where you hate the character so much, you you do bleed into the actual actor. It's like Cersei Lannister with Lena Headley. Like I think p- people, she's so <laughs> good in that that TV show that you ultimately fit below the line between that as a performer because it's so good in here. I think he does such a good job of being such a horrible human being that you do sort of look into it and go like, I don't really like Billy Zane. And I do think that's carried him throughout his career, unfortunately. But um, I'll be I'll be very brief with the technical ability here. Um, I don't think there's much, much structurally wrong with this. It's very long, but I think it has to be. I don't think you can do this in two and a half hours. And if you did, you'd cut out a lot of, sentimentality in this and there's there's a couple of scenes later on i'll talk about which i think is we talk about pause and reflect on this podcast about directors who in the in the midst of a film with really good pacing are able to calm something down and let us have an intimate moment with the characters um to really sort of appeal to to, to the the emotive um, discourse of the film and then get back on that track to make it just double down there's a really good moment in jaws um, Star Wars not so much but there's uh, Jurassic Park's full of them mostly Spielberg things there's one there's two or three in here and there's one that's actually devastating for me to watch I have to fast forward it everyone will know which one it is it's the, it's the elderly couple in the bed that to me even now mm. even thinking about that genuinely like is 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 stomach turning and, and I know there's a lot of devastation here in this film and if I can move very briefly from negatives to, to plaudits there's no one sacrificing a vision here. He's going to put on screen what he knows to be true about the human mentality of, of it being ignorant, nasty, um, uh, all those type of temperaments of making sure that the, the posh, uh, the, not the posh, but the, 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 the class system is, is showcased here. There's a lot to look at social craft and culture in ultimately what this devastation imploded and even further into its rags and, ri- rags and riches at the more not to get very profound here, but even in the moment of utter devastation of hours left to live, people still retorted to a class system and structure for survival, which I think is, is quite a devastating and um, brutal assessment of where we are. And, and in, the, in the world of 1997 of utter excess, you know, you've got Waterworld before this, you've got the Matrix afterwards, you've got visual excess, we're going to do everything with CGI now. Um, it's one of the very few films who, who, who lets it puts it on screen and, and, and doesn't sacrifice a vision, which uh, it's always nice to see. But I'll, I'll let I'll let either one of you two take over because I don't I don't have many negatives on a, on, a, on a cinematic sense. I think this is really well crafted. I don't think a, a James Cameron on a production quality can could ever be criticised for being um, poorly uh, maintained. I think that's just one of those things we've got to accept that. It's very difficult to find faults in, but we'll I'll, we'll get there. Give me give me time, and I'll find something that will work. I'll jump in here. Uh, I and piggyback off of what um, Jack just said, but uh, I think the main problem for me in this film, where I really really struggle, is I think I think it's James Cameron and how he writes romance. Um, I haven't seen the Avatar films, and I've heard similar things that it just seems a little bit out there or happens too quickly. And um, other than that, yeah, I can't weigh in very much because I have not seen those movies. Uh, I I was familiar with the two leads in different ways before I saw this film. And I think that's also a problem that I had, even though, I mean, looking back, I was quite young. So it's kind of weird. I had seen her in other things and I had seen him in other things um, in more grown up films. So seeing them in this and seeing, you know, how the scenes are set up and like the dialogue, some of the dialogue they have to say and some of the things that Cameron made them do is so um, painful for me to watch. Like as far as like, um, you know, just being really uncomfortable and cringing the whole time. uh, I think that's where I really struggle because as performers, I I do appreciate what they've done quite a bit. Um, And, uh, 
it was kind of shocking to see it's like oh this is what they're working with and they fortunately I think you know they did become friends in real life so there is you know some chemistry there and stuff so um that that made it work but but a lot of it like a lot of the romance is is where I I really um struggle but the rest of the film um like Jack said everything that has to do with the sinking of the ship what's happening on the ship the class divide has always um caught my attention and even more so now because as an adult I have a much deeper understanding of what that means um and just the little stories like you that you see there's little mini arcs i'm sure because there's so many people who you've watched this repeatedly over and over and you can follow tons of people who are just like um background characters and what eventually happens to them and stuff but at the same time it is romanticized one tiny scene this i had a problem with was the um the mother putting her kids to sleep because i was like oh that's really sweet but they're all going to drown in there because it's like that's not really the end it's still going to be really horrific um so there is kind of an emotional truth and then there's the actual truth and what Cameron opts to show sometimes is the emotional truth, which really works on an audience and got people incredibly invested. I have to add, yeah, cause I was in the theater. I remember my, my brother and I were sitting there, he's 12 and I'm 13 and everyone was sobbing in the theater. Like you could hear people sobbing at the end. And we just both looked at each other and we were so uncomfortable, like, Oh no, this is because it was the first time we'd heard an audience be that devastated. And I haven't heard, or I didn't hear anyone cry in the audience that hard until I went and saw, I think it was the fifth or the sixth Harry Potter movie, which everyone had the one where Harry was killed in the woods. People were crying through that, but it was nothing like Titanic. Like it destroyed people. <laughs> so, um, I mean, there are, there are negatives and things like that, but um, I'm interested um, in what Carson has to say. And I have to say like hearing when it was re-released last year and there was people in later like, teens or the early twenties seeing this film for the first time. And they said, you know, I loved it. And they're um, posting videos on social media and they're crying because they're so deeply touched. I actually, that actually warms my heart a little bit. The fact that they loved it so much, it's not for me, but I'm glad that um, people still like it. Cause as, a production it's like jack said it's it's really beautiful to look at and it does illustrate this this tragedy that happened for me it's just the love story <laughs> god help me i can't engage with the love story but i'll also defend parts of it we'll get more into it later carson can i can i just interject there because there's something go I, for it I, it just because it's I, I think it's important what hillary said there just on the romance i i think there's been this um, and rightly and wrongly as well, I think there's been this sort of stance on James Cameron to write really strong female characters. And having watched quite a lot of his stuff recently, especially the two Terminators, this and the Abyss, they didn't see it rhyme there. But the one thing that I, I actually push back at that because I don't think he can write anything but masculinity, and I don't think there's a problem with that. But when you look at his films, there's this linear lineage uh, of of tone about progressing um if it's if it's form or texture or even sensibility of any of these of, of these female characters they either have to become masculine to survive find a form of masculinity or defined mm -hmm. by the masculinity and i think i think it's interesting that he, he even when you talk about the the that there's a very like i'll push back it as well because i i also don't like the infamous paint painting drawing scene i just think that's a texture that he's put in there that just feels like it's like the sentimentality about it's just like oh I can just it just so one sequence I feel like it's forced like what you said it's very uh, emotionally telling of the film not not there's no like actuality about it. it's all reactionary and I think when I look at that it's interesting that after that he has to build like he builds up a beauty and she's 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 uh, also she's extremely pretty in this film as well like she's extremely pretty kittens I know she's She's often said in the press that she's struggled with her, with her body confidence after this film, which I think is also just the cruel, cruel mentality of audiences are just pathetic um, on the audience's behalf. But she's, she's, she's utterly beautiful here as well. And the film does a really good job of owning that beauty because she, she's not, she's not have confidence in the film. And as it builds up, after that moment, it just like sort of goes where she has to find like a rugged edge. She, she has to lose the woman in a in a way, which is interesting that they did the same thing to Kira Knightley in uh, 
uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, which I think is strange. There's nothing wrong with that. I think it's quite quite fun to watch. It's a, it's a sort of subvert expectations. But when you look at James Cameron as a director, even like Sarah Connor, and you look at um, The Abyss, and, and we'll get into it with with uh, uh, Ripley as well. Like he's not very good at uh, writing uh, uh, um, the female form with any form, any form of emotion or sentimentality or knowing what like the maybe what womanhood is. And I think when you look, watch Bigelow, which is uh, is ex wife, I think she grasps that <laughs> far more more interesting. <laughs> like if you watch Blue Steel, which which Uncut Gems did, and you watch The Way of Water, or even Strange Days or Point Break. She's the director on that part where she 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 might not have the budgets, but she runs rings around him writing characters about masculinity. I just think he's very one note. I just wanted to mention that. I'm sorry for for for, for butting in, Cass. I'm sorry. No, you're totally fine. Um, and I think you can see that even in Titanic with the writing. Like mm-hmm. it's all about kind of, in a sense, rejecting the femininity and the fanciness, then embracing the masculinity. Anyway, um, I really don't have many issues. I'll be honest. Um, I think the only one for me is that sometimes it can feel a little bit repetitive in some of the human conflicts. Um, I mean, I I agree with Jack that this needs to be a long film, maybe three hours, like 15 minutes. You could trim down to like three Oh five three. But I don't have any issue really with that. I think actually the pacing and the um, out the blueprint, the layout of this film is like brilliant. Um, I will say maybe the one area also is like, at the beginning, it does take a little bit of time to set up, and I think maybe that could have been cut down a little bit. But um, I think especially when you look at the layout from actually hitting the iceberg and everything that transcends in that rise of escalation from there, because obviously we all know what's going to happen to Titanic, right? This is not going to be a shocking reveal. The boat's going to go down. The boat's going to sink. People are going to die. Um, I really appreciate how much time is spent from the actual iceberg hit to that moment, because it does give the supernatural rise and escalation that I think is really, really effective and really well done. I will push back in the sense of like, I think probably the best part of this film for me is the chemistry between Winslet and Leo. I think this is like, I don't know, not, I don't think this is a hot take for most people, but like, I think this is probably one of the better <laughs> cinematic romances. Um, you can get into the writing and some of the scenes are definitely awkward, but like, I think their chemistry on a performance level for me was quite undeniable. Um, I think that definitely was one of the bits that elevated is like, these characters really only knew each other for a handful of days. Yes. You don't get a ton of time with them, but their performances, their chemistry made me care about them enough to where at the end, the certain scenes do carry a gravitas. Like you do care. Like I am there emotionally interested in what's going to happen, emotionally engaged, um, feeling the stakes of that scene. Uh, so I think for me, the performances, I mean, overall, I think this is a fantastic ensemble. I almost think it's a little like dirty that everyone only talks about Winslet and Leo. Cause this cast mm-hmm. overall is, I think fantastic top to bottom. Um, but I really would look at complaints and that's kind of why I want to start with it. Cause I don't feel like there's a ton to get into, at least with quality of film here. Um, I just don't feel like there's many, I think overall, like I just continually am impressed at a film of this size. That is again, a pretty simplistic romance. Like I don't think any of us sitting here are going to be like, this is such an elevated piece, but actually I will say it is a little bit more complex. than I think people also give it credit for maybe to completely go against my own point here. Like, Cameron, and I have a lot of respect for Cameron, actually. I wrote an article for Clapper a while ago on Cameron that I'd recommend you read. But like, I think he has a lot he's tackling with here, trying to create a romance, trying to create a drama, trying to create like the objective, what happened with the Titanic. He obviously has a lot of interest in the Titanic. I think he said that he has spent more time diving on the Titanic um, than the actual captain did of the real Titanic on board. So he loves the Titanic. He is fascinated. This is one of his special <laughs> interests is just the ocean in general, but especially the Titanic. Um, maybe we, I hope others can love the Titanic and not go in a submersible craft down there. I think that we've seen is not a great strategy um, in recent years, but um I think Cameron is wrestling with a lot here. And I think he overall crafts a film that carries all of its elements perfectly. This is a great showcase of what happened on the Titanic and capturing, like you mentioned, Hillary, the class divides, capturing the fascinating morality of this tale among all different parties. But he also crafts, in my opinion, a very effective romance and narrative that keeps me engaged. And those two sides are not necessarily the easiest things to 
have in relation to each other. Um, and the fact that it's this good, I think, speaks to a lot of like Cameron's ability as a filmmaker. I've not seen everything he's done, but I think overall with what I've seen, when you talk about great directors, Cameron also often gets overlooked. And I think he is really quite talented, um, more than people give him credit for. Between this episode and there's another we'll talk about later in the series. Um, I just think like, I don't know. I really, I, I'm a Cameron boy, to be honest. I'm kind of a James Cameron stan, if you can't tell. Um, so other than I don't like Terminator, but you know what? Everyone has their bad eggs, but you know, whatever. <laughs> no, um, actually, just to just to be clear, I think I I, I may have, um, I may have a, not spoken so clearly. Like the, the chemistry between the two of them is there. I don't want to make it seem like, well, they were just kind of going through. No, the chemistry is actually what carries the film and the fact that they're both very good actors. I think at the time, a lot of people didn't know that. And it was after this film and its wild success that they proved themselves in separate ways of what they were capable of. Um, it's definitely there. It's just to go back. It's like, it's what they're working with. And it's actually um, because of their ability as actors. I think sometimes if you think about other people doing the scenes that they did, it, it might've been, it would have been very, very different, but yes, they, um, the chemistry to be clear is, is definitely there. Um, but I think you could put them in a lot of different things, different relationships. And I think no matter what they'd be playing, they'd be doing a great job. I will say the one thing on the cut that we watched Jack, um, the open mat cut that I did not notice in theaters is some of the effects on the open mat cut do look very dated. Um, <laughs> I, when I was in theaters, and I'm sure they retouched it and everything, it looked fine. I will say that's one of the areas here where as we transition more and more with these blockbusters into using CGI and visual effects, we could watch Jaws fine. We could watch most of Jurassic Park completely fine. We could watch Star Wars fine. This is the first one to me that the effects are starting to feel quite dated at times, which mm. I guess is kind of comes with the territory, but also being, you know, 1997 visual effects, it makes sense. Well, yeah, what can you do? Something to note. <laughs> um, oh, just you could build the entire Titanic, Hillary. Come on. Yes. What do you mean? You could build the Titanic, <laughs> sail it out at sea. What do you think Spielberg and Lucas would have done? Come on. Um, it's it's not uh, just one thing I wanted to bring up because you guys were talking about length and then a little bit about promotion. Wayne and as someone who was um, who was around when they promoted this film, the first trailer, I think you could probably find it on YouTube. Everything I'm going to talk about, you can probably find on YouTube. The first trailer for it framed it as an action movie, and it's very fast fascinating to watch like there was um fight scenes and all sorts of sorts of things they took out and another thing to watch is the deleted scenes because good lord they took out some alternate and deleted scenes that were awful like really bad um there was like an extended fight scene between dicaprio and david warner that was like i think people probably would have laughed because it just seemed weird um, to suddenly have like a fist fight in the middle of um, a sinking ship situation. And then there was an alternate ending where um, Ooh, I think like yeah. Bill Paxton like sees Gloria Stewart tossing the diamond and then he's cool with it. And then like the music swells and they all throw back their heads and laugh. It's really, really cheesy. I'm glad they took that out. Um, so I think considering those scenes were shot and maybe they were in a cut at some point with test audiences. I'm not entirely sure. It is a testament that certain things were taken out and it was made a little bit shorter and maybe not, it didn't get too out there, but those scenes do exist as far as like some things where you're watching, you're like, Oh no, I'm really glad this was not in here because it's not working. Um, so just like a, a little trivia break in there um, <laughs> about what could have been in the film. Oh, also, as we get into just, like some random facts here, I'll just recommend anyone check out A Night to Remember. I think it was made in like the 50s or 60s. It was about the Ooh. Titanic. It was a film. No one talks about it. And like Cameron... Mm -hmm. Cameron is very open. It's not great. I'll be honest. I watched it like Cameron's very open that he just took dialogue and scenes from that movie and put it in this. And it's very weird to look at the film after you've seen Titanic and be like, oh, you're copying so much from this film. And no one mentions it or gives it credit, which is just odd to me, but valid, I guess. Um, I would just like I talking think, about where cinema came from. I would recommend. <laughs> I think it has like one of the first performances. Like, I don't think it's a performance. I think it's more like a background of Sean Connery as well. It's 1958, isn't it? I think it, I think he said because it um it was so close or as close to to that um sinking of the ship he could get uh 
what essentially was first count evidence of what happened there as well, which is that that's like devastating as well. But yeah, Night to Remember is a good film. Um, and there's some actors who are in this film that portray the same characters they did in that film, which is interesting. What? That's strange. Ooh, a lot that's of interest. Please share. There. Yes, I don't know uh, anything Bernard about Bernard Fox is in both. Um, wow. Yeah, same character. So go off, King. <laughs> he loves it. <laughs> Um, I have to point out too uh, what you were saying earlier. Uh, I, actually, I think it was Carson. It, it was Jack. I apologize about how people in the ensemble are very good and are often overlooked. Um, I've felt strongly about it before, and um, it was confirmed while watching it again. You know, Bernard Hill, who recently passed as the captain, Victor mm. Garber, Jonathan Hyde. Just the one scene where he gets on the lifeboat and they lower him down anyway. It's just like this thirty-second scene where you just see what a coward he is but he's relieved he's getting out of the situation um kathy bates and uh, yeah once again yes. um david warner and francis fisher there's really great little character moments in this film that aren't related to the two leads that are quite great and they usually aren't talked about so i i agree about that which I love. I love that Cameron is trying to, in some ways with this, not just capture a singular story, but really trying to show that this was a big event and it affects so many. And it was like trying to capture, I guess, the size of this historical event is not necessarily something you see with like the ideology of films like this all the time, but giving such a wide ensemble of characters, giving so much time dedicated to the lower classes and showing to some degree of realism what they are going through. Um, I, I really, again, just like, Cameron's ideology with this film, I just kind of fall in love with the more I think about it. Um, I don't know if either of you have anything to say about it, but like, I just am really continually impressed uh, by how it manages the size and the uh, point of the size also. Yeah, th th this this might bring us on to that next question because it, it's it's a good it's a good segue. Um, I, I can't help but see this as like a visionary put onto screen, and I I, I, I agree with you. I think after um, True Lies. This is actually quite like a um, a dangerous film to make. He, he's done. He's probably earned it. I mean, he lost loads of money with The Abyss, made a decent amount of money back with True Lies, um, but did did Terminator Two to a roaring success. Did did its predecessor um, bef before that? Again, the, the Abyss came before that, so he had to do Terminator Two, like Coppola had to do Godfather Part Three. And I think with the Terminator, I think you can and Piranha Two, you can uh, let those be uh, lay But I think when it comes to this, he had to make something that was commercial. And he had to sort of try and match that with his visionary. And I think sometimes we're seeing it now with Costner and Coppola. The two are very difficult to meld because usually a visionary will be something so ideologically personal to that and, and emotionally personal. And I think the conviction can be sometimes a bit um, constrained to, towards an audience because of that, just because it's not really as accessible and emotionally or, or, or even narratively. Here it's a good concoction of getting both of them right. It, it is still a risk, and I think for I think he would have survived this. I don't know to what extent we get the next thing we're going to talk about, but there's a lengthy delay which I'm, I'm going to touch on a bit later. What what sort of annoys me with Cameron, and not to shit on this parade here, because I I also like James Cameron. I think he's the he's the the Christopher Nolan before his time. I think the generation now looks at Vill Villanueva for um, Cameron likes Jackson fans out there. Emmy winner, by the way, and then you've got Christopher. You've got the Christopher Nolan fans. I think they've taken the modern um, sci-fi, or at least the modern blockbuster, to an extent now, now where it's you can make Tenet or Inception, and you can have really interesting conversations, regardless if I like them or not. But you can still meet commercialism there and still have them quite um, provocative, especially just in narrative. Let's say Cameron is, is sort of before that time in a way that the Abyss would have hit really well now, not then. But the, the, the Titanic is, is is a really go, great um, idea of, of the melding together. I, like I said, I've always liked James Cameron, but the more you read about Cameron as you grow up, and the more you look at more film, not to say that people not not that, that came across like when you maturely when you grow up maturely, not not at all. But I think when you more read into his cycles and you more read into his 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 productions, the guy is a monster. And I don't say that <laughs> whittlingly, and I don't say that half hazardly. You read about the production history here about like literally. Um, na having a nail gun on set to nail phones on walls, which to me is like like it, it's it's funny, but but in the same time I just think like really like it, 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 if you can't get the professionalism on your set then that's be that's your issue. 
uh, a that shows it, and b to, to to go to an extreme there under under stress. And I think I know the, the late great John Landau has just died, his production partner, um, which and I think John Landau ultimately was his right hand man, but also he 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 desensitized everything on set. He was the person of the middle ground to 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 calm it down with Fox, notoriously with the abyss, this and with with the next thing we're gonna do. He was the person who would it would it would go to Fox and say, look, we're on time, we'll make we'll make that we'll make the budget will be fine with the stories back and forth. But you read about the production history of the Abyss, which comes almost like a ten years before this. He almost killed three or four people on set there. And and it's interesting how that has become notorious in its own right, but ultimately become quite underwhelming to listen to. I don't think anything is worthy of someone not going home after after having the luxury of working on a film set. I think that 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 is something in in this day and age now, and we we spoke about John Landis last week. Um, that that should not happen. I I just think that with with a strict liability and 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 the production manifestos that people have and the security that should not happen. And I think he's he's constantly walked the line of being very dangerous on set, but also being this practitioner of whiz visionary. And he he's he's found it successful, but I think it's lucky. And when I look at the the, the 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 output of Titanic, I look at a director who who is who is willing to put his his career and his ego on the line, but also it being a voice for his ego. I don't know many people who could say that. Maybe you could say the first part of Dune was that. Maybe that would that's an interesting comparison to like I'm going to do this. I'm going to have my name on it, and I'm going to make Chapter Two. And I don't really care if anyone says I can't make money. I, I like that. I like the goal there. But I think the difference is that the two, this is a monumental achievement within the cinematic craft. If it's if it's CGI or if it's the the what the blockbuster can really do, we've seen it before on this podcast, like Jurassic Park before it, Star Wars, Jaws. We've seen what the blockbuster um, could do, but with Titanic, we can see what it can do. Like making a billion dollars, that's that's insane. And I think to to go into the the second part of this is what this caused within the box office stardom and also what it caused to James Cameron's career, career because I don't know where you want to go with this, cast. if you want to do the former or latter, I'll, I'll throw it to you. But I think there's seismic repercussions <laughs> with the both. I think we can focus on, because I know we're going to talk about Cameron later in the series, why don't we focus on what this did with the box office and we can save some of the Cameron evolution because we're going to see where he goes in this series, right? So Yeah. I think maybe let's save some of that conversation and let's get into what this did for the blockbuster and the box office. The one thing I'll say just quickly before we move on, though, is like I agree with your points that those on set actions and risks like Cameron's obviously someone who doesn't who's willing to take a risk right in his personal life. And he's very clearly someone who's willing to go out there and do whatever it takes to get the shot, get the moment, get the adrenaline pumping. Um, I think it's important to be very clear in conversations um and i see a lot of like twitter and a lot of film people do this often where they will take something very traumatic that happens on set as long as it doesn't actually result in direct tragedy and then build it up as this like magnificent piece of lore i think a lot yeah. about the exorcist and how people talk about the actions on the exorcist to get certain shots and like even if it physically like hurt people on set to like have lasting issues um people are like oh but it got this shot and that's so worth it i think it's very important that we not only call that out but also we refuse in a sense to build a clean mythos about that because it is something you talk about when you talk about kubrick when you talk about friedkin when you talk about cameron you can talk about the results of that and how the results were really good but it's important i think not to act like that is something we should be striving for and that's something that we should be worshipping as being like that is the correct thing to do on set because it's so very clearly not um just like even past just being able to walk away from a set um i think being able to feel safe to feel comfortable to feel like the, the effects are very genuine and real and lasting so i do think that's an important conversation to bring up when appropriate and i think that we just need to be careful when we talk about those things that we're not like isn't it so cool that this person almost drowned isn't it so cool that they like, strapped this woman in and threw her across the room and like broke her back for the shot isn't that so cool i think we need to be careful in general and i'm not just saying this podcast but like 
film Twitter, film communities, people who watch film, people who talk about films in general, not to overly celebrate that as if that is like somehow good because it's very much so explicitly not good. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I yeah. agree. Sorry. Oh, I, 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 I <laughs> <laughs> I'll be a very quick. I, I I don't want to be looked at in the corner where I'm like boo booing this. And I'm like, oh, you should never work again. I just think it's an interesting element to Cameron's career where people often sort of don't read between the, the lines. Like if you read about his behavior on the set of True Lies, like he was a tyrant. He was a tyrant on the film we're going to do next. He was a tyrant on this. I just don't know. I think I think in in, in places like that, and it also comes with the commercial thing. If you're going to make money out of it, people don't really want to challenge you on it. But it's also, I think it ties into the sensationalism of the 90s as well, where, you know, you, you have this different era coming up. Money is like exploding everywhere, extravagance on the digital market. And I think he's in this era where because the, money, the Titanic makes so much money, we sensationalize these things. Like if Titanic had bombed, I think there'd be, a, there'd be a, probably like a, an indictment, especially on the abyss. Can you imagine if like one of the, like someone died on the set and they had to resuscitate them on the, on the abyss. It's like, what are we doing here? Like, and, and you know, it's partly up to Cameron, but it's also partly up to these producers as well and these these safeguarding people. Like, what are we doing? Like, what what? Can you imagine like, having to ring someone up and and like even just on the basis? I know this is quite dark, this, but even like if you're like working healthcare, and you've got to make that phone call. I mean, that's tragic. Imagine doing that on a film set. Like, oh, like oh, my husband or my wife's gone to set to be a, a sound engineer, or like you know, and you just think you just never expect that phone call. And I don't I don't want to like boo boo and sob sob about it because. But it's all positive, but I just think that Cameron's behavior sometimes it's like you just read about it. It's 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 quite frightening to me. But I don't want to shit on him. I I agree with you. I think he's a he's a visionary. But I, I, I did I, go on, Hillary. I don't I don't want to I don't want to boo boo this no. anymore. No, um, it's it's very much in the same vein, and I'll be brief as well because I know we want to get to other things. But I feel like I have to address it because people in my personal life have known that. Um, I think maybe not so much now, but there was kind of this feeling that I hated James Cameron. And uh, to be clear, it's never been about what he's made or his films. Um, he's always been very solid and he has created um, films that have completely changed the trajectory of like how certain genres are handled. And he's been copied thousands of times over. But my problem with him very early on, and once again, at a very young age, was here, I think it was the first time um, especially because it was different as far as information. Um, like now, like Carson mentioned, film Twitter, you hear about a lot of this stuff or you read about it online. Um, with Cameron, my problem with him was how he treated actors. Even um, mm -hmm. even though it was just this production, I found out about stuff that happened on other sets as well much, much later. But it was just what he put his actors through and the way he talked to them and how he put them down or came up with like degrading nicknames or just screaming at them, things like that. It just made me not like him as a person. Um, so I think that probably did leave a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth, but as you know, I do tend to keep it separate. But for example, I was totally shocked that Kate Winslet worked with him again for the Avatar Agreed. movies because, because he was horrible to her on a lot of levels. So um, water under the bridge, I suppose, no pun intended. But um, but it is it is that commercial thing, isn't it, Hillary? It's about if he's making money, people keep keep yeah. being quiet. And and, and look, she this need, is not, she needs it. Yeah, yeah. And it's she not, needs it's not it because she's made some bad yeah. decisions as far as like yeah. what she's appeared in. Um, the she Academy needs, Award hasn't she gone very it. far, has it? No. No, nope, um, it can be a curse. Yeah, and and look, this is not this is not like a, a witch hunt at James Cameron. I just I just think he's one of many people. But it's like you you said, there's this. The the more like, like, like there are literally people who had to be resuscitated on the abyss. Like Ed Harris, Ed Harris, who was like the villain in A History of Violence, uh, you know. And uh, granted, he's an actor, but like he, he broke down driving home from a set. Like, like what? Like what? In what what capacity are we, is that allowed to be accessible? And yes, like, performance and acting, but it's all this. Is, it's, it's a really grey area now of. Of, of practitioner about putting three i mean i always go back to the terence malick thing on the the set of a new world a 78 year old christopher Plummer climb that tree what climb that tree i want to film you climb that tree and then halfway through decided to go and and, and film a, a, a bird and he was like i'll never work with you again i'm just thinking like what how in what i mean where where, where is the basic line it's not just about this abuse thing that, that that's that's quite prominent now and thankfully so in, in this industry but it's also a very like strong line of like, where are you able to say no 
because I'll just get someone else. So it, it, it's interesting about him being a practitioner, but the, the argument against that is that, well, he's a visionary. And I think that's all well and good, but at what cost? You know, mm. do we need yeah. the biggest film ever made at the cost of we're killing two people? You know, I, 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 I'm sort of <laughs> slightly aghast and against that, but, but I go back to the point. Um, we, we talked about the latter thing, um, Cass, and I know I don't want to get into it too because obviously the, the, the film we're going to talk about, but I think this caused a very interesting thing within his career in that I think the both are quite connected with the box office result and his career. There, there, bec- there becomes a sensationalism after this about what's going to be next, and this this held it, its its roots for for quite a considerable amount of time, and ultimately he himself dethroned it. But there's quite a few films after this that that, that copied, not copied, but looked at the idea of what we can meet being commercial and, and not avant-garde, but pro- provocative in the sense of how can we evolve the medium. And the one that comes after this is obviously Lord of the Rings. Now, he looks at Lord of the Rings five years after, looks at what Weta Digital are doing, and looks and like, I think I can do this and I can, I can make it my own. And he obviously goes and does what he does in 2008 and 2009. But between them, there's a 10-year decade, a 10-year decade where we didn't get a James Cameron film and I think that's the biggest sin of this feature is that he was so caught up in the ego of success is that he had to choose something that would be spellbinding and evolve the medium. And to me, I think that's the most disenfranchised thing I could think of what this film caused in that within 10-year gap of, of, a, of an era where it's a very difficult 10-year gap because you get the comic book boom towards the end of it. But for the first eight years of the 2000s, I can't quite nail on what the uh, the the idea of what's to bring out because I know he wanted to do the Spider Man, he bought the rights to do Spider Man, and work on it with Fox, but they said, but then he pulled out of that because he wanted to do other things, which I, f- I think is just very strange. Although his his Spider Man film would have been interesting, like Burton's Batman would have been, it'd have been interesting what Sam Raimi would have done. But I, I, I digress. But I look at his his positioning of this, and I, I see a man chasing the book, I see a man chasing the idea of of the format of a film and the only times you could get him or to be offered to see him genuinely was him talking at blu-ray functions with michael mann and oliver stone and michael mann hadn't made a film well it was was calmed down after Miami vice oliver stone had blown everything away with 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 um alexander in 2004 you had these icons now looking at the digital process of film and not looking at like making films themselves why Oliver Stone is making Alexander, I don't know. But why James Cameron didn't go and make something else? And granted, I don't want him to go and make Terminator 3, although I wish he would have done. Just a lit, let, let that go, because that man cannot let that franchise go, and that's another conversation entirely. But for me, I just find it quite compelling in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an underwhelming and, and quite uh, disgruntled sense of, we had a 10-year gap where he would just go and shoot three documentaries underwater because he, he invested in that submarine thing. And, you know, if that's his, if that's his ego project, then that's, that's good enough. But for the talent and the seismic range he had as a creative, to, 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 to make three documentaries, two of them about this fucking thing, you know, we've done that. Like, you know, I want to see you do something different. I don't think now he would, he would, he would do that. And, where this has gone from chasing that book and chasing the, the what how can we evolve the medium as setting back and making these films now, which I, I find just like slightly redundant. I just look at this and I, and, and walk, walking out of this, like even now, oh God, what is this guy going to do next? Like he, everything was against him. Like you said, cast everything, the, the production, the budget, the audience were against him, the cast, everything was like, it's just not going to work. You know, we're going to test screen this. We're going to have to, we're going to stop the, um, the domestic premiere, we're going to do it overseas. That's crazy. But it still hit the heights. And I think when I look at that, I like the gamble. I'm like, what is he going to do next? Like watching Inception with Nolan, that to me is like, I cannot wait to see what this guy does next. When when Villeneuve does, does Dune, I'm like, I can't wait till what he does next. Because I know he wants to do some Isaac um, Asmanoff sci-fi stuff. It's like the modern day Kubrick. What is he going to do next? And to to find a ten year gap of him doing three documentaries, what one about the Bismarck, which was sanked, which he went to go find. He has this, and then he obviously developed a watch with Rolex as well, which I think is just he has this. It's just this weird thing where he got like stuck on, I don't know, like he hyper hyper um, sensationalized and hyper focused 
on a on a, a very strange topic of underwater deep sea exploration um and just forgot about movies and i'm just like i, I just find that so com- perplexing even now to figure out why did anyone start just not stop him it's like J- jim you've got to come back you know is it that arnie left and went to to be the governator and that the, he saw the medium at a point where he wanted to see where it would take him. No, he, he wanted to see where that would evolve before he would take that, which I think not a lot of people remember this. And I'm going to bring this back next week or when we do this other thing is that I think he's quite coy here. I think he purposely waited those years to see where that would take him and he wouldn't take the CGI. I think it's a very conscious decision to take a step back. But I look at this and I think where this ended up with Hollywood, I think people begin to chase this high. And I think it's it's sort of caught two years later with a with a, a certain George Lucas. And then after that, it doesn't really hit again maybe for another decade, does it? It's a very strange time because there's... Well, we can go on forever here. I'll, I'll move on. I, I know. But I just think it's an interesting time that people start chasing the high. Fox have another hit on their hands with Lucas two years later. But we'll, you know, <laughs> we'll get. Well, I'm sure one day we'll get there. Uh, but there's an interesting thing there, isn't there? There's an interesting thing with Fox and 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 their their establishments, what they've got, and this being an original IP as well. It's crazy. Uh, but yeah, I'll move on to to someone else. I don't want to take up everything. But I just find it like I just I just get so disenfranchised looking at this and be like, why did you just not do anything? Like you could have you could have changed the medium. You could have done things at the time because he was a massive proponent of Blu-ray. Like he put his corner in blue because they they had a fight with HD DVD, which is essentially Microsoft versus Sony, and Sony won because they imported the Blu-ray player into the PlayStation Three, and Microsoft didn't because you know that's what they want to do, and Sony Blu-ray won, and I think he's been a massive proponent of that. But he he, he started producing vehicles. Elite, Elite he was meant to make, he didn't, and then Terminator Dark Fate. Well, you know, let it, let it, let them be now. But I think I just look at him as a director and as a visionary. And when we look back, all said and done. And this is uh, this is such a vanity thing, I, and I, I don't want this to come across egotistical. I will look back at him, and I will honestly say, you didn't do enough. You didn't do enough. You had the time, you had the energy, and you had the skill, and you didn't provide enough on this world at the time you could have done. I know that's so egotistical to say, and people will be like, how dare you? How Who do you think you are? But I, I, I generally do think that. I'll say the same about Lucas. I will. You could have done more. You could have done so much more with the power you have. Um, and I think I look at this and I just think just a constant reminder of what if Carson to me, what if you have two conversations happening and we talked about the, like with Lucas and his filmography and how it was sad. He didn't direct more films. I will say first, just talking about just quickly, the like uh, blockbusters. I think when you look at now in the films, studios refusing to take risks, I think a large uh, part of that comes from Titanic. Titanic showed if you reinforce like a simplistic narrative that plays into the tropes people expect, you don't take many risks. It's going to have box office returns throughout the two thousands. You see films that try to take greater risks that ultimately don't, get the same box office reaction so i think when you look at it you can easily see that titanic i think probably leads the way that gets ultimately ultimately reinforced probably by certain modern films we'll talk about as far as that logic um i am at like a complete opposite page than you when it comes to looking at cameron's career as a director i love that he just went in a little submarine and went under the sea after this. He's always been, I find, a very reactionary filmmaker, right? Like, he's interested by underwater. He makes the abyss. He then becomes, like, hyper-focused on the Titanic, and he makes Titanic. He just, like, went underwater, becomes hyper-focused on that exploration, finds something so cool down there eventually, and you can literally see in his 2005 documentary, his eyes, like, widen as he sees these underwater creatures, and then literally creates new technology to put that on screen with a project we'll talk about in a few weeks like i love that like yes could he be a director that makes a film every two years and it's fantastic absolutely but i also respect that people don't have to make film their entire lives i love that he just has money now and then he just goes underwater and develops like deep sea technology because he thinks it's really fascinating he has this wonderful little hobby that he goes down makes huge (laughs) scientific discoveries and then eventually finds something where he's like this is cool enough that i actually want to put this on screen because he wants the audience at home to feel the same level he does about these things he's thought the titanic was cool and he said i'm gonna show everyone how cool the titanic is by literally making the titanic and making a three-hour film about it 
And then he did it. He was like, wow, these underwater creatures and this like these life forms and ecology, this can all be really cool. I want to put this on screen and we'll talk about it. Then he did it. And he literally developed for decades technology to be able to take us under the water with him and just like have that experience that he had in that submarine. Maybe I am very kind with my reading on all this but i like that's why i love cameron i love cameron because he consistently goes out there he has this like adventurer soul where he goes out there on an adventure and then he's like that was life-changing for me how can i bring this to everyone on the big screen and use cinema to create this and show everyone how cool this is i think this is like a lovely filmography yes i wish it was more and i do agree like he could make great films in there but I have no issue with what he's done other than Lucas, who Lucas just like sat there and like visited sets. <laughs> Lucas didn't go to the bottom of the ocean. You know, Lucas didn't find well, all this new life and go in this. <laughs> like I would much rather take Cameron and him doing something fun. And then we also get like great footage of him <laughs> coming up from the sub and learning about nine 11. Like he's creating iconic footage along the way. Oh. Uh, yes. Maybe one too many Titanic documentaries, like after a decade of making Titanic <laughs> documentaries, let's move on Cameron. Um, but I have no issue with this filmography. I really like genuinely. I love Cameron. I think so much more because of how he's handled these things. Um, you're such a romantic. Maybe that's just me. Like, you're such a romantic. It's like it's Nicola Grasso rubbing off on you. It's like it's just such romanticizing like, things. I look. I, I'm not going to. I'm not arguing with you. I, I, I respect that. But I also think like the modern day equivalent is the action star doing it now, which is weird. Like Tom Cruise is doing it. Like he's he's evolving what you can do on screen and stunt work and trying to move it on by still making film every two or three years, if it's not a Mission Impossible film, and still do something else. Um, I agree. I don't think he's going to make a film every two years. I just think that there's two films in that decade era where I think we could have just, we could have had something, but I, I just think that the, the, it's just not catch. It's not captured. So excuse me. It's not caught up to the point where he fi finds it accessible. I think in an era now, like with the, with the jungle book and, and stuff like that, I think he, he could create really interesting stories, but, We'll get onto that in a few weeks, I'm sure. <laughs> we know you're sitting there in theater alone with your popcorn, being like, "Where's the new James Cameron film?" But you know, it's, it's not filming. I just it? have to, I have to weigh in really quick and say, you know, because of this conversation, I would really recommend looking up the South Park um, bit they do about James Cameron going down in a submarine. It is making fun of him because it is South Park, but I feel like it is, it would be a fun little supplement for listeners to look up after <laughs> listening to this podcast because it's hilarious. I might go rewatch it after this because that is very <laughs> funny. <laughs> um, with that, maybe let's wrap up final thoughts on Cameron, final thoughts on Titanic for now. Um, I will start. I love Titanic. I'm happy we had a really, I think, um, worthwhile conversation on James Cameron and kind of the layers and complexities of him as a filmmaker because undeniably they're there. Um, but for me, I think Titanic still works wildly. And still, when you look at maybe playing ignorant some of the um, processes of how we get certain performances and how we get certain scenes, um, I really love his ideology as a filmmaker as far as what he's actually trying to accomplish. And I'm excited that we're going to get to talk about him after this big jump, after he goes down in the submarine, we're going to eventually get to talk about what comes out afterwards. Um, but as far as Titanic goes, I still think it's a lovely love story. Not one I need to rewatch a ton. I probably would not touch this for another few years, but like if it released in five years for like the 30th anniversary on the big screen, I would definitely go and have a good time. Do you want to take a Jack? I'm still gathering oh, yeah. my thoughts. So go for it. Yeah. I, I mean, um, I agree, I agree with Carson. This is not a film I, I, I actively seek out. I think it's an emotionally draining, and I think it's a it's a physically draining venture. I mean, three hours, it, it's 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 heartbreaking to watch. But it is one of those things where it just it's so devilishly cra crafted. And that's why I get really annoyed about him because I, I look at this and I'm like, you could you could do anything. Like at this point, like sci-fi is done. Like, but you, you you're going for like you're evolving the Gone with the Wind romantic. Um, uh, set piece to a point where like it hasn't been done before, and using using the Titanic as a back background, <laughs> which is crazy to think. Like like this, the whole budget here, like he, he basically brought it back up from the depths, gave it a new look of pain, and they they, they they caught it on screen and this CGI mammoth, and it's a third party to the events that are occurring. That's crazy. That's like do it. That is literally like doing um a film like literally about the Terminator. And the Terminator being like a third party that's just that's in that world, or you can make robots. Anyway, here here's Kyle Reese. It's like 
it's it's just it's so interesting that, that, that how he's captured and crafted this world and it not become um, a dissonant or or, or 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 become dissected or even fall apart on its own merits. But like you said, it's not a film I would actively seek out. This is probably the first time I've seen this for over, maybe 15 years. The last time I watched it, I had the Blu-ray that was released by Fox, which was like this the 3D version of it. I didn't watch the 3D cut of it when it came out in cinema because I'm not. I just don't find that interesting. I didn't find that era to be very, com- <laughs> very um, uh, 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 complex or even compelling at all. But this has had like three or four resets and re- re-goes. It's interesting that I think a lot of UK cinemas are doing the 90s era. I haven't seen much of this being showcased, which I think is strange because I think it would do very well. Um, well, you had Titanic the musical, right? For well, like, that's we also true. had Titanic that's... Two as well. But you know, we'll, we will get there one day. So I'm sure, maybe on gems, <laughs> not this. Uh, but but no, I, I think it's just a very a draining type of feature. And I look at this, and I look at all the positives ultimately become negatives, and that's how my brain works about it, just because I see it. But but no, I think the open mat version of it was was exquisite. I think. It, I, I, there's just some really wonderful iconography here. This feels like a, a feature celebrating um, man, mankind in one way and then damning them in, in another. And I think the complexity of that takes a really skilled filmmaker. And um, I, I just look at this and I think it's like, it is extremely compelling to watch, but it's one of those things where it's so draining. Um, but every time I watch it, or I, 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 I capture it. It's like the Zodiac, you know, you, you, can't, you get in this an hour in, 25 minutes in, two and a half hours and I think it's you complete it because it's just so invigorating to watch but I'm glad that we've seen it I'm glad that we've watched it again and um but yeah it's definitely top tier Cameron for me I just would say it's my top five I have a soft spot for the first term and I think that's that's filmmaking to me that's like not having any um permits and just going to make a film with a guy who can barely speak English called the oak <laughs> Um, and he's not, he's going to argue with you on set. You've got Michael Bean, Linda Hamilton, and and like that score, Stan Winston stuff. That that to me is like, you know, that's it. But I, I like True Lies as well. I'm, I'm that type of person. But I like Terminator Two, um, and I, I probably would say that I like this more than The Abyss. I hate the third act of The Abyss. That's why Ego to me is like Cameron, stop, Jim, calm down, calm down, son. But no, th- this is still like brilliant. Like th- no one laughs about this in in a filmography that dense as well, that um, elevated in in like going for 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 bigger themes about mankind. This is never laughed at. It's like oh, like it's like a oh, do you know like when um, like like a really big director makes like a silly film or something like that. This really has maintained its legacy. No one damns this. No one um, makes this to be his like offspring that he doesn't like it's very much weighted itself throughout its history extremely well so there's always a really strong positive there okay so i have like a a few like little tiny notes um like little trivia things before i get into my final thoughts and i think one um to kind of link back to something carson said at the beginning of this podcast about how it's not exactly responsible to go down and look at the titanic as we all know, because of that uh, tragedy. And there is a line in the movie about that, which I found really uh, prescient, where they say, you know, if anything happens, it's sayonara in two microseconds, which actually happened to some people um, recently. Um, And then, of course, like, there's a little offshoots because of the success of this film. Like I mentioned, the South Park James Cameron um, video, which I will put a link up on. uh, I have a list on Letterboxd called Recommendations from Podcasts. So, I'll add a link to that. And then also the drunk history about um, what happened with the baker, um, which is very entertaining. And then um, long before um, Titanic came out, there was a segment on reading rainbow about exploring the wreckage of the Titanic. And I think that's the first time that I saw it. Um, I don't know if I can find a link to that, but I might link to that as well because it's quite fascinating to see something about um, the Titanic. That's not James Cameron related. Um, It's a totally different team of people. So those are just my little bits and pieces. But overall, um, my final thoughts are um, seeing this again. um, The last time I saw it was 12 years ago. So a lot of time had passed. Um, At one point I was told, you know, like, why, like, haven't you just seen this? Like, why are you going to rewatch it again for this podcast? And I said, because it's been 12 years. (laughs) It's been a while. Um, One thing that did surprise me is that um, 
kind of struggling a little bit more with like how Rose was written. And I know that um, Jack mentioned that before. Um, may, it maybe is, you know, it depends on how you feel about Cameron's ability as a, as a writer. There is the one scene where she kind of is written to fall back on those tropes where it's like a woman being difficult or something like that, where they kind of have the argument on deck where she's like, you're just so annoying. <laughs> oh my God. Like you're just, yeah. And then she just like, won't leave and stuff. And then she stays because she's interested with, in him. You know, it's a kind of a clunky scene, but you know, the actors are doing what they can with it. Um, and at the same time, I have to remember that she's supposed to be 17 years old. Although Kate Winslet does not look 17 in this movie. I was watching and I was like, no way. <laughs> I think she was 21 when they filmed. Um, so yeah, kind of getting back to how you write femininity. Cameron, it's not his strong point. And you know, that's fine. He does. He's doing great by himself. And actually the scenes that Jack was talking about where she embraces masculinity and uh, there are some sequences, specifically the one where she goes to recover the ax that are framed more as action film sequences. They are ones that I identified with a little bit because I, you know, you put yourself in your shoes and you're like, okay, well, like the best version of myself, if there is someone I cared about who was in the same situation, like I've got to get out of there, or they're going to drown. You'd hope that you'd be able to have that capacity to be that smart and resourceful and maybe have a chance at saving them. So uh, there, there's parts of this that I definitely do appreciate. And uh, another thing that we didn't talk about was just how this film confronts through a multitude of characters of how humans face death, um, which is not something that you would figure would be in a blockbuster movie that's three hours long that made over a billion dollars. Um, people of different classes, different backgrounds, either facing death, you know, screaming or in fear or people facing it with dignity or, you know, as much bravery as they can. Um, one little um, joke that I wrote down is that the captain's death was probably the way James Cameron would want to go because it's water, you know, ha ha rim shot. So, and of course the musician scene, which a lot of people have talked about and is rooted in what actually happened um, on deck as far as how those musicians kept playing until um, pretty much they were facing their own death themselves and were quite um, brave about it. Um, another note I took down, as I said, someday someone will make a film like this about 9-11. And I hope I'm dead uh, by then. I don't want to see that. Someone hasn't seen 9-11 featuring Nicolas Cage and Whoopi Goldberg. Come on now. <laughs> um, I, th I thought that was more about the recovery. I'm thinking more about the attack itself, you know. Oh, I think that's... I, I mean, is it in there? Or I don't... Because I, 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 I haven't seen it. I think it is the attack. I think that's like the... Oh, okay. Well, the, then the I, stand, I stand corrected. Film. Well, can't well, say I'm too deep on it. <laughs> <laughs> and then some of my final thoughts are uh, returning to it. I, I wrote down, Jesus, that door is large. It's much bigger than I remembered. And it is something that it, it, this is strange that it's something that's still debated about. I had some friends bring it up recently and I said, I would have had a really hard time going through that and still wanting to live after watching someone who's done so much for me freeze to death. But in the end, it's what he wanted. He actually wanted her to live, so that's fine. And that brings me to my final thoughts, which is we talk like uh, Carson talked a little bit about these epic love stories. There's ones I could bring up from you know early like Gone with the Wind or more later examples such as The Notebook and Twilight. Very often, one of the problems I have with people who idealize or rewatch these stories is that the love interests in it are absolutely awful people in some ways, either one or the other or both. And one thing I will argue with people about with Titanic is that, I mean, Rose is kind of her own thing. Some people like her, some people don't. I've read some hilarious jokes online where it's like, it's just about this woman who fucked a hobo and then watched him die. Or, um, you know, I, what's his name? Uh, Slavov Zizek says that the whole film is just about an upper class rich bitch exploiting a working class man. Very, very mixed, you know, perceptions of what the film is all about but with him in particular if i think that's maybe why it warms my heart a little bit that younger people respond to the love story in the film is because very often male love interests are violent or they are can be borderline abusive or manipulative and things like that and when it comes to jack dawson when i've talked to people ab about it 
it's just like that was a decent person and if you are a teenage girl or whenever you see this or whatever teenage boy an adult whatever if you it's like that is someone like as far as a partner it's just about someone who cares about someone who's helpful who believes in them and does everything he can and fortunately he doesn't make it but he was a decent person and um wasn't awful so I do give the film kudos for that as far as like creating a model of like, yeah, if you look for those qualities in a partner, that, that's actually something to aspire to and um, is quite great. So that's like a little nugget of gold that I found in this film. And I, I think it should be addressed. And um, unfortunately, it did become really, really scary. I, I know you guys were young, but like Leo mania was really, really scary. It would think it was the first time that I'd seen someone famous be that objectified and kind of uh, broken down to the point where they weren't a human anymore. It was weird because it was a guy usually that happens to women and it mm -hmm. repeats itself all the time. But I think that did make a big impression on me as well, where it's like, oh, this is what fame can be like for people. And it really repelled me as well. And I think it repelled me from the film. So, um, I'll just wrap up. Those are my final thoughts. Quite a bit, but I went through my checklist. Thank you for listening. Not to digress. Thanks for joining. Yeah. Not, to digress. For <laughs> Not to digress there, but you know, Hillary, you said about um, a, a blockbuster made over a billion dollars about how it's dealt with death. Well, there's a film mm -hmm. that we're doing that the Russell brothers made, and they did a very brilliant job of doing that around a, around a table when they all sat there talking about you know, Captain America giving them a eulogy and having like a, a moment to talk to themselves. That made a billion dollars. So it's, it's James Cameron. <laughs> the, the Russo brothers have got something in common. But, oh, yes. It's the slightest of, of digs, yeah. Ugh. Anyway. <laughs> we'll get there. Prepare yourself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> With that, that's going to do it for our episode on Titanic. Uh, let's get into our question of the week. This was a kind of vague question purposefully. Um, what is your favorite movie that has an important boat scene or important boat? Something tied to a boat. That's all I need in this as a film that has some connection to an aquatic craft. Hillary, what is your answer? What film do you really like that has a boat in it? When I read that question, I panicked a little bit because I have this basic rule in my head that's not entirely true. Just to be honest, it's like very often if boats appear in films, something bad happens on them, which isn't entirely <laughs> true, but uh, it, it, it can happen. Uh, so I, I thought about it for a while and I thought, oh my God, I'm an idiot. There's great films that feature boats. And I'll mention two. One is a short and one's a feature and they're both Buster Keaton movies. One is called The Boat. It's from 1921 and very, very funny. Just about a guy trying to sail it with his family on a boat and everything goes wrong. And then The Navigator from 1924, which is about two rich people who are stuck on a, on a steam liner that ends up adrift in the ocean and they have to figure out how to take care of themselves because they're incredibly inept um so those are my boat recommendations buster keaton all the way man love it uh jack what boat stuck out to you in cinema's history well i i agree with hillary that i i think when boats come on screen that's quite ominous in movies so uh my my two are like eerily sort of similar to titanic i, I couldn't split the two but i think they're important for two different reasons the first one i'm gonna go old school like hillary did uh Alfred Hitchcock's life, but yes, it has a very much uh, pro uh, war figure with the Allies and stuff. That's, I don't think that's a problem with the film itself, but it's in the midst of a, of a boat, boat sinking and the aftermath of people having to figure out um, who is lying, who, 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 is, who is telling the truth, um, giving little of the getting giving away small instances of themselves in the in the hope that they'll. They'll prosper from it, and then others taking that to their advantage. Very interesting Hitchcock film made purely on a lifeboat. Uh, really cool. So, in 1944, very hard to find the Blu ray of that now. Um, and my other one is in, in the other parallel it's Apocalypse Now, Coppola. <sighs> Getting it, taking, taking, taking a, a boat into the heart of darkness to find out more no about the in the 11. Oh, yeah. Um, I, 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 when I was reading this, the more I, was, I thought about Hillary's point there, I, I really do believe like ominous boats, Jurassic Park three, that's pretty, Jurassic Park two, um, Waterworld. Like I don't think there's been a really positive film that has a big boat set piece in it, or at least a boat's involved, like Captain Phillips. Um, it was all like really devastating, like dark, grim. Films. Life of Pi. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You could see it overboard as well, and that's that silly film with Adam Sandler with the, the what he's on. I don't know what 
And even that's a bad film, so I'll give that. But that was a good, great question. A good, a good brain teaser, anyway. Well, I'm happy you guys did such thorough work to uh, discover some really great boat films. So now I feel quite inadequate as a on the other side of it. Um, I struggled with this question. I was just looking through my top movies and seeing like what had a boat in it. Mm-hmm. Finding Nemo has a boat. <laughs> that and Claude does not have to do with boats, but it has a fantastic scene with a boat. Mamma Mia 2 has a lot of boats. Luca has boats. There's even the barge and cats. Um, but I, I think there was only one answer I could give, which is Jaws. Um, yes. We talked about on the podcast. Of course, the orca. <laughs> um, such impactful in the film, impactful for Spielberg's life. He used to go sit on it on the Universal back lot and just think about the trauma of making the film. Such a romantic. He came- no, until he walked up one day and they destroyed it. They cut it apart and they took away his boat without telling him. And he said, where's my orca? And they said, it's gone. So sorry for Spielberg, but that's what he used to do. So, <laughs> um, but Jaws. You're such a romantic. I love that about you. Like, you're, you're such a positive. Like, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Depends on who I'm talking about. Um, yeah, if yeah. you get a Jim Cummings film on the podcast, I probably won't be. But um, yeah, Jasmine, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yes, I do. I I did read your review about the latest uh, Jim Cummings short, which I re- I was really repelled by. I am not usually repelled by stuff, but it made me not want to live. <laughs> the worst thing in the world but that's okay uh with that let's go to our rapid reviews anything we've seen recently that we've not talked about on the podcast jack everyone's strap in for about four hours here what have you seen this week this is surprisingly brief here i watched uh i'm midway through the crow salvation in preparation for the abomination that will be the remake of the crow i can't wait um i rewatched beverly hills cop 2 because i feel like i got that wrong i watched it again after watching axel F. I don't know what it's, I don't even know what it's called anymore. And I was like, this doesn't have a plot, but I, but I enjoyed it for the aesthetic of Tony Scott. Um, I watched some other strange ones. I watched a Steve Martin Rick Moranis comedy, My Blue Heaven, which is basically them retelling a comedy version of of um Harry. Uh, well, I can't remember his last name, but the guy who literally uh, Goodfellas, the guy about him. Like, is it Harry Hill or something like something Hill? Is it Henry uh, Hill? Henry I'm Hill. To that's, yeah. Is it Henry? Oh, You're it, close. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's how much I paid attention to the film, to be fair. But, but it, um, <laughs> Steve Martin does like a really fun job of it. Joan Cusack's really good in that. Uh, often forgotten. I watched Something in the Water based off Jakub Flausch's recommendation. Won't be doing that again. 86 minutes of like <laughs> like four, four teenage girls, one's getting married, and they, 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 they have an accident in a, in a boat and the, and, and the shark's around. And it was interesting for the most part, but it was just sort of like devoided into nothingness. I'd been on a Chevy Chase high, so I finished Fletch Lives, which was okay, but has some hor- horrific editing issues in that film. Like, his hand will move, pick something up, and we'll see the shot of him putting his hand down again. It's, like, really poorly done. I watched Caddyshack, which I thought was fine, but I, I haven't had that in my um, in my life, so I didn't realise how much, like, pop culture was taken out of that, like, the memes of it and everything, and like the Simpsons rips off, um, you know, uh, of that as well. So that, that was interesting enough. And the one, the last one I want to mention, and I mentioned it off air, I, I tried to finish Ty West's filmography and I watched In a Valley of Violence with John Travolta and Ethan Hawke. And I've not liked anything I've seen from Ty West. I quite enjoyed <laughs> this Western. Yes, it is, it I actually is, enjoyed it, that one too. Hillary, what have you seen recently? <laughs> Um, I have a few films um, written down. As far as like more contemporary stuff, I, I did finally see Perfect Days, the Vim Vendors film, and I, that was fantastic. Um, I was not able to see it in theaters because of where I live, um, so I had to wait for it to pop up on Hulu. Um, I don't know where else it's available um, internationally, but I would say it's worth seeing, even though it's a bit long. I think it's like two and a half hours or something, but um, worth every moment. Um I did see Furiosa, a Mad Max saga, saga, uh, saga, a Mad Max saga twice. And I would, you know, I think some people were kind of on the fence about seeing it and it didn't do very well in the box office, unfortunately. So I don't know, up those streaming numbers or buy a copy or something if you feel strongly about it, because I do think it'd be nice to see this franchise continue. And um, I enjoyed it a lot more than I, I thought it would. And um, I also saw The Bike Riders, which surprised me. Um, I was very on the fence about that film because of the trailers, the way they were cut and and everything. Um, But I found it to be a very interesting movie, not only about 
the nature of subcultures, but masculinity, as far as like choosing a male persona and then seeing where it takes you and where an entire group of people will end up. Uh, and then I have two shorts to recommend. Uh, one is related to Bill Viola, who I guess passed away yesterday. I didn't know much about him, but I would say check out the clip from his video installation Martyrs from 2014 on YouTube. Pretty cool images. Um, I'm kind of a sucker for installation art. So you can see that there's like a minute long clip and then uh, a short that I've watched repeatedly. I think you can only find it on Canopy. I don't know where else you can find it, but it's called What Happened to Her. It's by a filmmaker named Christy Guevara Flanagan. And it's nothing but um, kind of like a media archaeology dive into images of dead women in films. It's about 15 minutes long. And once you start realizing how many images there are of dead, beautiful women and um, how they're, it's, it's very much like a part of our storytelling, it's really hard to unsee that. So those are my two recommendations and uh, my three mainstream-ish um, recent watches that I enjoyed very much. Love it. Um, I only have two films really I've seen this week. Um, I saw Kurosawa's The Hidden Fortress, which is pretty much the direct uh, inspiration for a lot of Star Wars. I thought the film was fine, probably on the lesser end of Kurosawa's filmography, but very interesting seeing him work with like comedy in this sense because he's not he has comedy elements in a lot of his films, but he doesn't necessarily have like slapstick comedy almost, which he does in this film, which was just weird to see. But I thought it was kind of all over the place, but it was fine. Um, but the big one this week is obviously Oz Perkins' Long Legs. I'm not going to spoil anything, Jack. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> obviously, a very weird marketing campaign that's kind of been a lot, <laughs> to be honest, over the last month, um, which is more confusing once you see the film. Not to give anything away, but this is being portrayed both critically with what people are saying about it and in marketing as being kind of more of a straightforward serial killer film. And it definitely evolves beyond that. I think it stuck the landing, definitely messy, definitely some big jumps in logic. Um, and it introduces just, I mean, it is an Oz Perkins film ultimately. So it is an ambitious, an ambitious world um, with ambitious ideas. It's trying to give you a lot of mythology, a lot of lore, a lot of twists and turns. And I think overall it does feel engaging. It has enough of a craft, enough of a tone. Um, the one element here that really bothered me was Nicolas Cage because this man needs to be stopped. I'm so sorry, everyone. He, <laughs> over the last, the meme, <laughs> the memification of Nicolas Cage over the last decade has like completely derailed his career to where he has some good moments here and there. But like overall, I am so sick of seeing people put Nicolas Cage on screen and just being like, isn't it weird? It's Nicolas Cage. That's worthwhile. And this film has been hyping up Nicolas Cage so much. And I think he's like atrocious, genuinely gave me a headache in the film. Um, weird definitely a weird character definitely a weird performance so i guess you're going well there um but just didn't fully work for me but outside of nicholas cage i thought the film worked and i'm curious what you think jack and i'm curious what this will be on rewatches because there's a lot here um but it is definitely i will say an oz perkins film which for better or for worse i'm excited to see what he does with the monkey next year because already in february he has this next film a stephen king adaptation which is kind of crazy hmm. um but I enjoyed Long Legs overall, but I know very divisive film. So I'm just about to go see that after this. I'm going to go on my bike and go with, check it out at my local theater. Um, <laughs> I don't know whether I like it or not, um, but I'm kind of repaired either way. We'll see. I am fascinated what you think of it. I'm not going to spoil anywhere anywhere it goes, but like, oh, I'll probably write something. <laughs> I'm sure you're going to write something. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do my Oz Perkins marathon, and, and you can find me on Letterbox random stuff and you can find me on clap ltd uk where i'm gonna my, my review for horizons on tuesday i think and then some other stuff i'm hoping to gear up but again thank you very much for, in, for inviting me on hillary it's always a pleasure to listen to you and, and hear you talk because um i find your opinions on film fascinating and all the positives we've cast and um i love being on here i love you inviting me so thank you very much well for just um listening to me ramble and, and just, <laughs> just having to deal with it. So thank you very much for another week of just absolute pleasure. So thank you. Thank you again. Countdown for horizon part two, Jack. Hell yeah. Um, yeah never. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry for everyone at home that my mic got way worse just now, but deal with it. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at BP underscore movie reviews, letterbox Carson Tamar, quite a, 
busy month coming up on the podcast. We'll be back outside of a possible bonus episode we're going to throw in there. We'll be back in a couple weeks for Twisters, um, Deadpool and Wolverine. Then after that, we have Trap. And then after that, so almost a month away, we have our next Summer of Blockbusters episode just spaced out like that, where we're going to be covering the first Lord of the Rings, getting into the 2000s. We mentioned it on today's episode, uh, deep diving into that. So that will be exciting. Thank you so much for listening. Goodbye.